Hello and uh, welcome. Thank you for listening. Uh, we're glad that you are tuned in. Uh, we are bringing you another review and um, we hope that uh, you'll enjoy it. Uh, my name is Juan here with Kevin. Hello. And we like movies. Right, that's enough from our studio audience. Um, uh, just a quick reminder before we get into it um, to follow us, uh, especially if this is your first time listening, uh, subscribe uh, so that you do not miss uh, any episodes. We are we got a few more episodes in um, in this season in season two. So again, if you have not heard every episode there's plenty in our catalog uh to go back and listen to there are some gems there but uh after that we we'll, yeah. be, we'll be uh taking a brief hiatus and uh hopefully coming back for season three uh maybe with uh the third member of our party uh mr mark and uh and uh, yeah, we'll have some new movies to look at. But until then, yeah, follow us, subscribe, um, comment, let us know if there's any movies that you want us to review uh, here in season three. Doesn't matter how old or how recent, um, we will uh, take it into consideration. And um, uh, and yeah, uh, also yeah, just like it and share if you can. Uh, all right. So tonight's uh, offering comes from the wacky mind of Kevin, who uh, will 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 wait to hear uh, his reasoning for picking this film. Um, but uh, I can tell you that it is called "I Used to Be Famous." It uh, can be found as. Uh, only, I believe, streaming on Netflix. It is a 2022 film uh, that has a runtime of an hour and 44 minutes. Um, let's see here. It is directed by Eddie Sternberg in his uh, feature film directorial debut. Screenplay is written by Zach Klein and also by Mr. Sternberg. It stars Ed, help me out here, Scrine, Scrin, yeah. Scrine. Scrine. Ed Scrine, who you may know from uh, as the villain in the original Deadpool. Um, also stars Leo Long and Eleanor Matsura. It is uh, produced by 40 Foot Pictures, again, distributed by Netflix, uh, was shot in the UK. Um, and let me give you a very quick breakdown of what the movie is about. It follows Vince, a desperate former pop star who dreams of making a comeback. An impromptu jam session with autistic young drummer Stevie sparks an unexpected friendship between the two misunderstood musicians. So that is I Used to Be Famous. Uh, Kevin, why don't you go ahead and give us the scoop on why you picked this and uh, maybe your uh, first thoughts. All right. The drums to bring me in. Thank you. Um, I, I caught the trailer on Netflix one day with Ava and we watch it. We're like, Ooh, we really want to see this movie. And she's been asking to watch it. And I was like, all right, I, w I really, it was on my list to watch for y'all. And it just looked like a lighthearted, you know, a feel good movie. And I was like, Ooh, I really want to do one of these feel good movies. Like it was British. It was like about a boy type movie. That's what I thought it was going to be. And that's basically why I want to see, it. I, I love the poster for it too. And I just love the aesthetics that were in the trailer. So I was like, let's give this a shot. And that's basically my whole uh, 
reasoning for it. Just that I really like the trailer. And overall, watching it, I'm it's a movie I'm glad I saw. It I may have gotten really deep into it when we'll talk about unpacking the movie. But overall, like I said, it's just about these broken people who find each other. There's, you know, a mom who who's giving everything to her son and can't let go. It's a son who feels guilty about he thinks he cost his mom something. And it's a guy who is trying to recapture something he thinks is going to make him whole again after he had this terrible loss and he's chasing something. And it's about people trying to get what they think they need and then finding out what they really do need. And that's legit. Oh. That's my gist of it. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't disagree that some of those things are there, <laughs> but, uh, I was not uh, enamored with this film. Um, it was, for the most part, pretty bland. I felt it was not great storytelling. Um, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was a Lifetime movie or a Hallmark movie. Um, it was uh, contrived and formulaic and artificial. Um, including a big climactic uh, final performance that's meant to generate uh, all the feels and all pull all the emotional heartstrings. Um, but uh, so it had a little bit of a high there, but really throughout the movie, I felt like it was pretty bad storytelling, pretty bad character development. Um, just, just, um, asking the audience to fill in a bunch of gaps um, that they left uh, underdeveloped, um, which a more robust and profound story, I think, would have would have done. So, yeah, was not impressed, felt like for the most part, it was a waste of my time. Um, its charm was lost on me. Um, I won't knock the acting. The acting was good, but uh, but yeah, everything else felt forced, and it just felt like a vehicle with a message about you know inclusivity for people um, that uh, are autistic or you know affected by some sort of um, maybe mental handicap. That yeah. I agree shouldn't limit them from participating and I think we've seen that done more more successfully and unconvincingly in in other stories uh, again in this one it felt forced and and contrived so like, I, I will I will say the build up like the beginning part of the story a lot of it was cliched you yeah. know what I mean um I do think the resolution to to their issues I felt like subverted some of the cliche because I thought they were going to go be a band. I thought they were going to make it big at first. So at least I subverted my thoughts of the cliche-ness where it was going. Um, I don't think it's all necessary about um, inclusivity for like people with autism or asthma or whatever it's called now. But I do think it was about, like I said, um, there's a time where this boy's growing up, but his mom doesn't want to let him go. You know what I mean? She was afraid to let him do anything. And she was holding him back. And again, I don't think that's for all of them. I just think it's on this story. You know, it, you know, and again, again, it could have dealt more with, you know, the pain that he was feeling because he felt like he, he was holding his mom back from doing her dreams and dancing. Um, it was showing her not being able to let go of him because, again, you, you give your whole life to your child and your child's like, I don't need you anymore. I'm growing up. And I think, and at least that scene to me was really, really good because it's even if your child doesn't have autism or a disability or any of that stuff, it's just getting to that point where your your child doesn't need you anymore. You need to back off. And mm -hmm. I, I thought that that presented like like I said, I thought there were pr good parts along, even though some of it, like a, a lot of it, was cliched leading up. And then I really liked. Um, 
some of the stuff that they were dealing with, like Ed Screen, Vince's character, the Vince mm-hmm. character. Mm-hmm. Um, like I said, I really, again, I might have gone too deep into it. I saw it twice. You know what I mean? I watched it again yeah. today with my mom. So the second time I was able to, you know, just to delve more into the stuff that, you know, he was dealing with as a person, you know, losing a brother and not being there when his brother was dying. And he picked fame and stardom over, you know, and, it, and he missed that moment and it presented itself again. And I think what, um, what that black guy said, Dia, like the black pastor music guy, when yeah. he shows up, he's like, oh, I'm lost. He goes, and now you're found. He goes, come on in. Uh, you know, and it's all about finding that change of your heart. And of course, like I said, it was a big contrived final moment like all these type of movies have, like this big spectacle. But I, I found it sweet overall, and I found it, even the song that he was singing, that it was it was not just cathartic, but it was this, this broken person finding something that, you know, was more valuable to him than what he thought he needed. Mm. Which, of course, we ultimately knew was going to happen. Mm. Or else it would just be a boring movie, but yeah. Yeah, I just... I didn't just didn't need... do it for you. Well, it's just, I mean, you could, a lot of those things that you said, I feel like you could find in a lot of Hallmark or Lifetime movies, you know, um, it just, it felt, it felt like a soap opera, you know, and yeah. I did say the acting was good. Yeah. I also felt like the, the, the music was good in it. I was surprised by the inclusion of a Doobie Brothers song that came oh. out of nowhere, although it fit that scene very well. But um, yeah, and again, I'm 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 not saying the movie. Yeah, it's not. I mean, it's pretty heavy handed with the inclusivity stuff. Um, but uh, and and again, not that I'm opposed to that. I just think it's been done way better in other films so in in that way it didn't really even service that very well um again there were especially at the beginning as they're setting up this character i don't like the way that they chose to uh for for things to unfold like the very little that you that you learn about him at the beginning is uh, from a scene of him about to do a show when he was in this boy band called, uh, what was Stere- it? Stereo, Stereo Dream. Stereo Dream. And he was like the, the main guy in it. Um, and then there's like some news report talking about him. And that's, that's giving you the background information that kind of sets up the character and sets up the story. I felt that was a terrible way to do it, you know, because you're not really letting us into who this man is, you know, just telling it to us that way. Um, There were some scenes that, again, were just so cheesy. Um, So, again, contrived and forced and artificial, like when he hasn't been to the drum circle in a while and then he comes back and the teacher's like, oh, okay, who's going to be our heart? Oh, um, I forget the character's name. Um, Vince. Vince, oh Vince, you be our heart, and of course he's gonna pick him. Why would he pick anyone else? Because it's his moment, it's his movie, it's his scene. It's like the and there were, you know, uh, the the main the main conflict towards the beginning when uh, he 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 gets you know the boy um, whose name was. Stevie, uh, Stevie, right? He he finally can, he convinces him and his mom to come do this performance at this pub, and then when you know the, someone in the crowd get under, you know, I guess not understandably, but um, expectedly so, you know, at this pub, um, starts to get out of hand and rowdy, and no one else stops him. You know, no one else says, "Hey, man, cool it." relax you know um and he's like picking on the boy even on on both of them and and vince like stands up for him maybe goes a little bit over top and like starts a fight with this guy i felt like again 
the I felt like for the most part the mom wasn't very uh very likable, um and again I I'm sure it was written this way, um to show her her evolution throughout the film, but it was so frustrating to see her not be able to empathize with that he was trying to protect her son the whole time, which is why he did that. Sure, she then later says that like she put him in danger, and yeah, you could see that, but it's like at least give him cut him some slack and say like yeah it was a it was a, a bad situation it was an uncomfortable position i wish it wouldn't have happened you put my son in danger but hey you were sticking up for him and i appreciate that like that 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 didn't really happen uh so um the well, well i think part of that was also it's this 44 like 40 year old 37 year old, i don't know how old he was but like this like 30 something year old man who just became friends with her son and she's been overprotective like her son doesn't do anything without her so i think that part of it like again i do agree that like she was unlikable for for a majority of the movie because she's just being so overprotective and it was i feel, i do feel it was written that way and i think that's why there was no slack cut because she didn't want to cut anybody slack mm -hmm. if that makes sense at least I, it felt like it was true to her character which was unlikable, which is why yeah. she wouldn't give anyone slack. And I was going to say, in the bar, there was a lady who was telling the guy to shut up, but yeah. then that's all That's all it was. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, you, you know, I, and I think mainly it was it was hard for me to see beyond, you know, what what you mentioned of just these cliche, cliches, right? And yeah. especially with the main character, like, because... It's 2023, and we've already been through so many boy bands, you know, going back to even, you know, Menudo and uh, <laughs> New Kids on the Block, and then the, the late 90s, early 2000s, Backstreet Boys and Sync. Like, we know what the, you know, used to be famous character is supposed to be like. So, because it's kind of a plug and play character. He doesn't need to tell us exactly, you know, um, or, or show us what that conflict was like, um, you know, what the conversations were with the other bandmates, why inexplicably this guy um, is, is, you know, a few, uh, a few, almost like a few weeks away from like being homeless, you know, where, so like where out of all this time, he he has no money left he has no connections you know except for you know the one ba bandmate you know who became really famous that he does reach out to but um it's just really it it, it was such a drastic drop inexplicably to that point where yeah you're like completely tied off completely separated from this world um that you're you only get your next break again because, you know, uh, serendipitously someone shot a video of you performing, you know, with the boy um, and in pr pretty much an impromptu set that sounded rehearsed and then happened to go viral. Um, again, it's just like taking these shortcuts, not developing things well, not, not, um, it's just bad storytelling and it, it, it's just, it's just, again, while I, while even I, you know, enjoyed the, the redemptive arc at the end and because I'm a human with flesh and blood, yeah, it was like, <laughs> yeah, the ending is good or whatever. And it's uplifting. But aside from that, it was just, yeah, like, I don't like lifetime movies. And I will say this was the one thing I agree with what you just said was I do wish we saw more of what led him to break, you know, to leave the group or get kicked out of the group. Because again, I, I... I mean, and let, let, well, let's be fair, right? They do show that it was, he had to make a decision. Yeah, well, he... no, actually, actually, that's, that was just, that's actually, that decision was why he ended up not being Missing. there for his brother when he died yes. and he stayed in the group. We yes. don't actually see what broke the group up. Yeah, we which don't would have know, been like... important. Like, right. to me, like, what I would have liked, because this is what, again, like you said, I had a feeling in my head. I felt that, he, that now he got depressed and he got sad and he was upset. And he, 
again, it caused friction because he missed his brother's, you know, he missed his brother. And that led to his down to maybe drugs, maybe not, maybe fighting. I do wish we would have seen what led to the breakup. Because, again, was he kicked out because he wasn't really there anymore? Or did he quit? And I think that's the one I would agree with you. I wish they would have explored more on, like, hey, why did they break up? And even when the Vince character told Austin, like, he goes, oh, he goes, oh, oh yeah, you should have stood up for me back then. Like, then? I was like, was he talking about the time when he didn't want to go on tour? Or was he talking about a whole other time? You know what I mean? I'm like, so there was a lot that they left. And again, I don't know if it was cut out or they just didn't think about showing it. That I wish they would have developed more on, like, what led to this breakup. You know, from him well, leaving the clearly, band. There was all, clearly, there was an element with the, the manager character. Yeah. Who, again, is another character that we've heard of from that circumstance you know this this person who wields this power over these young boys or over britney spears or whatever and hmm. you know ends up you know pretty much dictating what they're what they're able to do you know is again what was the what was the elvis guy what was his name uh, oh, colonel parker Colonel Parker, yeah, the Colonel mm -hmm. Parker in every one of these tales. So clearly they had this character in there, but again, just dynamics of that were just not given to us. That, yeah. that you know, while there's a framework that we can recognize, we're like, oh, there's that character. Clearly that, that probably created some major issues and and still continues to do so they even show afterward when he decides i guess i guess he decided not to go on tour with uh um what'd you call him Ethan austin robert Arthur? austin roberts with austin, austin rob yeah i guess he decided not to go on tour and there's like a brief moment where they show austin and the manager seemingly having an argument i don't know what it was we don't hear it there was like a musical montage going on over it well, well no that, that so that's when he left the like papers for, he left the papers for him to sign and then he just looked up and then that's when it cuts to the birthday part at the end yeah but um but the, and then they showed austin and the manager in the in the recording studio having a, a discussion that didn't seem like a happy discussion oh yeah it no yeah like, he went in there know, they, there were they were uh, I think but, they were but talking, we don't, but... Like, we don't know. Yeah, we don't know. So, ultimately, we know that this manager character is, is like an insidious figure. Yeah. But and I, and so we don't know of... if he's we don't know if he signed or not. We just know that he went to the birthday. Yeah. But yeah. I was going to tell you, since you brought up Austin, I actually liked Austin Roberts' character because yeah. I kept waiting for him to do a jerky thing or say something jerky to, to Vince. But he actually yeah. showed up at, at the performance, even though he was a little bit late. You know what I mean? And he and even though like he left, he, he kept trying to extend um I guess I don't know if he felt guilty or if he felt anything, but he kept trying to, you know, to help out, you know, Vince once it kept going. And I kept expecting because there was a lot of cliches, I kept expecting him to say something kind of backhanded and jerky to uh Yeah. To Vince. But I actually liked yeah. his character because I felt like it did subvert a lot of cliche because I'm like he was this big superstar. He was like, "Hey, this guy was my friend," uh, you know, and he kept he kept trying to go to bat for him. Yeah, and then admitted, you know, or even uh, apologized for what you know for whatever he did or didn't do, you know, way back when. Yeah, because he's like, "Yeah, I could have been there for you more," you know what I mean? And so I did like I did I did think that character like subverted a lot of uh, the cliches that I was expecting. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't know anything that the manager did that was horrible, except kept saying that, hey, we might forget about you, so don't take too long. Yeah, I mean, there were things, again, there were these signs like he tried to change, you know, later on uh, or in oh, present yeah. time when, you know, they're bringing him on board as a, as a support act on this yeah. tour. And now he's trying to change his sound. He's the one that convinced them. Or you know, manipulated him into not bringing Stevie along, mm -hmm. and and then is trying to get him to sign this contract. So again, it's like those elements are there, but uh, it's not real character and, development. It's and then very I think, dimensional. And I think this is where like I differ on you a little bit. Like I don't think he manipulated at all. Like I think with the story, at least the story I was picking up, 
is, and I, I do think it, it, may, it wasn't real. It was just obstacles being placed in Vince's way. And it was all about trying to, you know, show Vince. I'm like, all right, well, do you want it? And you have to make your decision. Well, he, he picked going on tour instead of being with Stevie. And it was all about, you know, that selfishness that, you know, well, this is what I want. Well, if you want it, you're going to have to sacrifice this. And he kept doing it. And man, what was, um, and it's just like other movies were reviewed, like, you know, Green Knight. I just think it kept giving him opportunities to do the right thing and not do the right thing. And he kept, again, he kept reliving like the same mistakes he did. And I guess the one thing that popped to mind, and this is what pops to my mind, um, was, um, it was a verse, which is again, Mark eight thirty six, like for, for what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And I think that's what kept going through my head when I was watching this movie, even the, especially the second time. I was like, he was just willing to trade everything the first time. Like, again, when he had to make that decision, you want fame or do you want to go see your brother? And he's like, no, I, well, he chose. You know what I mean? And then when we catch up with him again, he's trying to recapture that to fill whatever he feels is lost inside him. And again, he's being offered all these things, like everything he's ever wanted. And he keeps choosing it because, you know, he's human and we need a story. And I think at the end, I, I like to believe he didn't sign because he's like, you know what? I'm going to take that job in the drum circle and I'm going to teach these people because, you know what? I didn't need, I don't need the fame to fix what's inside me. And I think that's what, even when he looks at Stevie at the end and says, it's your time now. Like you said, everything in the movie was all about him. Like when he was chose to lead, when he was, and then when he, I do feel that when he said, you know, it's your time now, you know what I mean? He was giving it away because he's like, you know what? I don't need to be the center right now. You, you take it. And I, and I, I think that's why, again, I might've looked deeper into it than, you know, other people were, but that's what I was feeling when I was watching this movie about a man who came to the point where he's like, I don't need to be the center of attention. I, I can help other people. And through that, it's, it's helping me heal what's inside me. Yeah. I just, and, and I, to me, the, uh, and with all that I said, I of course I it could have been told, it could have been told a little, you know, better. Yeah, but those I mean, are the things again, I was you're, picking you're up. You're saying that you're you're excavating and you're also filling in holes, and then, you know, you're thinking about it, you know, deeply and all this stuff. And yes, all of that stuff is there, but it's or or all that stuff can be found, but it's it it's not what was what was presented, you know, on the surface. Um, and 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 I also and it, it was also like I don't know I I, I really don't know I just uh, and, and again I I'm sh there are obviously because uh, I mean this movie has an eighty four percent audience score and an eighty percent critic score so um, there's clearly audiences you know that gobble this up. It's just not for me. And, and it's fu um, very it's funny that 80% critic score, it's literally 8 out of 10. There's only 10 reviews. Yeah. Yeah, I'll give you another scene, right? So um the that first gig goes horribly. Well, it goes um, well, but it's horribly. The mom, sure. The mom goes, "Yeah, never doing that again." Vince goes off to do some soul searching. It goes to see his mom. And, yeah. And Eddie, I guess, even though that was Wait, a difficult moment. Wait, who's Eddie? Grew, Stevie? Stevie. Uh, found something in it, discovered something, enjoyed maybe performing or, or what, you know, he found with Vince or just that experience though initially probably frightening and scary um uh i th he was able to to pull something positive out of it to the point where you know without vince knowing he's like oh all, even though he's this you know beyond 
socially awkward. I mean, he's he's autistic and has just social issues. It's why he's a part of this drum circle. Um, it's why he uh, is very, very, crip, you know, is, is cripplingly shy and is, you know, we're led to believe he's incapable of kind of, you know, uh, performing well in in these social circumstances. But anyway, all of a sudden, you know, without taking baby steps or without showing us, you know, a growth journey or anything, almost from one moment to the next, he's walking into all these pubs and he's selling even at times, yeah, really being a salesman uh, to these bar owners and these managers for them to give them another another gig. And he's confident and he's got bravado and he's got personality. And it was just an unbelievable, I have to imagine, you know, though I can't speak from personal experience, but uh, almost utterly unrealistic trans growth and transition in a short amount of, of time without showing us really, you know, the steps to get there. Or even, even if it was just a bold leap into that, it wouldn't have gone as, as successfully and as flawlessly as it did for him. So it was just another point where it's like, okay, you're trying to tell your story. This is a part of your story, but I'm just not buying it. Well, he did get some rejection on that in the beginning, but and it wasn't crippling to him. It wasn't. But what I think it represented again, this is my opinion trying to know what I yeah. thought that represented was when he did that. I think he might've been capable of that all along. But his mother wouldn't let him do anything. Even in the beginning, when she, when she catches him playing with Vince in the beginning, she's like, what are you doing? You can't be alone. He can't do this by himself. And him just being always caged by his mom, like, was was stunting his, not necessarily stunting his girl. Like, he may have been capable of it for a whole time. But just being so protective, you don't, you don't even see what he's capable of. Which, ultimately, when he did it, again, it is more exaggerated because it's a movie. Because the guy just the kid just left in the middle of the night, made a flyer, and started going around. But I think it was to show that hey, this is what he's capable of, capable capable of, if you know, if you just let him be himself instead of keeping keep reminding him that he can't do things and he's not capable. Well, it's possible, and that sounds very nice with a cherry on top. <laughs> But I can't jump to that conclusion based on what was presented. Yes, it's possible that the, the mother was a helicopter mom to that extent. It didn't seem that way. I mean, at the beginning, he's at the he's at the park or whatever by himself when he in it when he initially starts drumming or you know, she's she's in the distance somewhere. He's got but she walked separation. Away. Yeah. She well, she walked away right? from him. she's like, I've been looking for you everywhere. Where'd you go? So there's that. They're in the drum circle where he's able to socialize. But she's um, right next to him in that drum circle. Yeah, but again, but it's still it's it's it, it could have been that or or huh. again when we when we meet him in some instances, his um, his ailment appears to be so debilitating that it's almost inconceivable, you know, that he'd be able to make that leap at that yeah. point. So again, I don't know if it, if, if ultimately the movie is better by thinking more profoundly about it or by not thinking and just accepting <laughs> what's there. Well, I was told by a good friend of mine once that you know, we do a disservice to a movie by just watching it and not thinking about it afterwards. Yeah, but thinking is one thing when you <laughs> no, are, again, uh, ev like, in gaps. Like, like the Green Knight. Yeah, evaluating, you know, what's presented and, 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 you know, measuring and dissecting, you know, the many layers of the character, of the development, of the script, of the images. Mm -hmm. You know, again, as I said, this was very comparable to either a Hallmark movie or a soap opera. 
I don't think it was a soap. It, 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 or it is. It is. I mean, it is uh, really uh, what I come to expect from uh, most Netflix original <laughs> movies. You know, but it, it was based. It, it is based on an award-winning short. Also, the short was like mm-hmm. sixteen minutes long. What was uh, the award? No, it had a whole bunch of them. I didn't remember any of them. It had like a full page of just awards going down. But um, so I'm guessing you. you <laughs> I saved for the after credits, by the way, and I and I like the after credits. Did you see that or no? No, well, it's nothing to see. It's literally because it was just running and. It ends after all the credits play and the music dies down. You hear like the three harmonica notes, and I thought it was cute. Uh, that his that his brother used to play. So yeah, yeah. So I guess we set our piece on it. You had anything else? Any other thoughts on it? Not really. Um, I guess. Again, and I was, it's not unexpected because I imagined that something like this was in play, but I guess the, um, the, the actor Leo Long, who plays Stevie, yes, it says he's neurodivergent yes. and diagnosed with a speech and language condition. Yes. Long said he is determined to make the industry more people friendly for disabled musicians and actors. Um, again, not a cause or an effort that I'm opposed to or that I would stand in the way of. But um, you know, you you have you have to do that. You know, with stories that are more uh, relatable. Um, that are with characters that are f- far more rich and profound and human, you know, than these two dimensional figurines. Um, I have a list of movies that I would recommend to people um, outside of this one if, if they want something like this, but they actually want a good version of it. There are I have a list of films. You mentioned one already, which is about a boy. Um, great, great uh, movie about you know the relationship mm-hmm. between uh, a father figure and a and a boy. Also with a great musical scene in it. Um, School of Rock, much better premise uh, and story and performances than this one. Uh, the musical Once. Once? Um, oh, yeah, I did think of Once when I was watching this, yeah. Much, much better film than this. Uh, here's a movie that I've never even seen, but I could probably <laughs> tell you is better than this, uh, which is Coda, which won Best Picture. Um, mm-hmm. It's on Apple. Uh, it's uh, I haven't seen it. I, I would see it. I'm not opposed to seeing it. I just haven't gotten around to it. I can almost guarantee that it's better than this. And the last one is one that we reviewed on our podcast um, at the beginning of this season, I want to say, or it might have been the end of season one. Bullet Train? But it's Sound of Metal. Okay. Um, I do think it was a season. You know, also deals with with similar themes. Uh, Again, much better film, much better characters much better storytelling and filmmaking. Um, it was cool to see this movie set in Rye Lane again after oh, we Lane. after we um, reviewed that film, Rye Lane. Apparently, that's the other uh, only place in England where there's a music scene and it's trendy and hip, I um, guess, based on the evidence of these two films. All of all, all of the UK is just Rye Lane and Notting Hill to me. And um, also another observation that became more apparent to me than in most other British films that I've seen. Uh, maybe it was just these characters, but man, the British people say in it a lot. <laughs> yeah. 
it, it's a it's a rainy day in it uh that's a crappy song in it uh want to have some or no i mean just it was it was in there a lot it was uh, so yeah that's it for me um i would like to say i have a fun fact but it's really not very fun so i don't but, even want to say it but well i will say i think out of all the movies you mentioned um about a boy is the most comparable to this one because you know it, it's almost similar where it's, it's a guy who needs to change who he is and meets a kid and there's you know socially awkward and they they help each other grow but the other ones, I mean, I, like I, I did think of other ones, like like once, but I don't, like once is a whole different type of story. Even though everyone out there yeah, should go I out mean, and watch elements, once. Yeah, there's elements of it. I think that are similar. Yeah, like, like I music. agree with you that a, <laughs> about a boy is the most. Uh, yeah. Well, and, I mean, it's and, and it's unfair to compare any movie to a Hugh Grant uh, vehicle because you know he's the man. Sing single handedly um elevating the level of anticipation for Wonka. <laughs> oh, I don't care how many protests there are. He's amazing. Yeah. But all right, um, so what's your not so fun fact since I won't play uh I won't play the ha the fun fact music. It's not fun at all. Um the song that Austin sings when Vince comes to visit him, titled Daughter which he says mm -hmm. is written for his daughter, was in fact written by director and co-writer Eddie Sternberg for his daughter. There you go. That's a, there was that's a... Not, that's not a sample of the song. <laughs> I did see in the credits, like, I forgot who wrote all the songs for Tin Man. Mm. And overall, like, I, again, I didn't, I didn't dislike Tin Man's music. I, I even like no. their their rendition of Rising Sun. Oh. oh yeah, no, like I said, the music was good. Um, man, I've never. I mean, it, it's been a long time since I've seen someone go that hard on the synth, on the synth, <laughs> synth the synthesizer. Synthesizer. Um, <laughs> that dude, dude, that guy had it hooked up to a car battery, bro. I uh, I was so surprised he didn't go with the uh, guitar. Um, cause that I think makes more sense for like a one man band, uh, especially a former boy band member. Dude, but, if he was uh, on the guitar oh, yeah. while Stevie was on the pots and pans. Yeah. It was great. Yeah. But it was, no, the music was good. And like I said, um, the acting was good. Ed Skrine, I think is a decent actor from the things that I've seen him in. I thought he was good in, in Deadpool. I don't know what else I've seen him in, but um, but yeah, he you know it wasn't his fault that I didn't like this movie. Um, I think he didn't have the greatest material, but I thought he brought as much life to the character as he could, and I think you could say the same for most of the performances. Ultimately, it was choices beyond them that uh, really make this a oh, subpar film for me. Oh, I would tell Ed was in Attila, Battle Angel, Maleficent, Mistress of Alita. Evil. Alita. Alita. Yeah. yeah. Attila. Yeah. Alita. Attila. The and uh, <laughs> and um, he will be in story. Rebel Moon, by the way, by, uh, by our boy Zack. Oh, okay. Zack Snyder. Yeah. And he was in a couple episodes of Games of Game of Thrones. He was in Midway. Midway? I didn't see Midway, but yeah, he was. I don't... Yeah. He was in Mal Maleficent? Mal the Maleficent, the Mistress of Evil. Yeah. Uh, oh, he was yeah. in the Transporter Refueled? Which I mean, yeah. Did he play the... Tra he, I think he actually played the Transporter. Yeah, like he took Statham, over. I don't think... Yeah. Played... Uh, um, oh, no. Yeah, because... Uh, Jason Statham played Frank Martin in the first three movies, and then, and then it became Oh, it this says guy. he played Frank Martin Jr. Yeah, so I think that might be his son. Okay. And then, and then uh, Northman of, of Viking Saga. I don't know if that was a good movie, but yeah. 
But like I said, like not, I, that is not <laughs> the same movie as like, Robert Eggers. No, but um, again, I, I again, I thought he did a really good job. I'm a sucker for movies about brothers, about redemption, and and feel good movies. I that that was my lane. I watched it with my daughter, and she loved it. And again, I enjoyed it. And I like that it wasn't it wasn't overly offensive. They had a couple of curse words in there. You know, they didn't throw in like him walking out of the bathroom showing his butt or anything. The label feel good can be so deceptive. It can be a decoy. It's it's it's, it's very so. subjective. It's very subjective. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll say that. Cuz but... some people feel good watching a slasher flick and some people Feel feel good watching this movie. Yeah, but I think when you when you slap that label on there, I think there is a specific connotation. There are specific, yeah, yeah, you could say that. You know, and it. I mean, I'm trying to think. What was the last feel good movie that I felt good about? I don't know. Uh, I don't have enough time on here to think think through that one. Like I, I mean, Rye Lane, I felt pretty good about, but that was a romantic comedy slash feel good movie. Well, here's a question for you: What's your uh, go to feel good movie? Say, so, you know what? I'm just gonna put this in because I just want to watch it and just get a little pick me up. I don't think it's. Um... It would be labeled a feel good movie, you know. It'd be like a comedy or a rom- romantic comedy that, you know, has that feel good element. But it's well, what, what would yours be? Cheaper by the dozen? That's a feel good movie. No, uh, comedy. This is comedy drama, as the genres. Um, feel good movie. Hmm. That's a tough one, man. Because it could be it could be a romantic comedy and be a feel good movie. Like if you said Notting Hill, you know what I mean? That's still a romantic comedy, but it's a feel good movie. Like it gives you the feels, the warms at the end. Uh, I, maybe love maybe love actually. Yeah, you know, something like that. One that I just watched the other night, which I watch every few months apparently, and I just realized. Um, uh, remember the Titans. Like I, I, I always watch it when I'm like I'm in a funk. I'm like, oh, let me just put this on, and I'm like, maybe I'll put this on to fall asleep, and I end up staying up the whole time watching it, yeah. and everything about it just makes me feel good. Even like the accident, and all the dialogue, I was like, oh, such a good movie. Did there's a quote from that movie that replays in my head every, almost every day at work? Because champions pay the price. No. <laughs> Attitude reflects leadership. Uh, okay. Captain. Yes. <laughs> Almost every day at work, I'm reminded of that quote. <laughs> All, and right. Just, All right. And it just, I just sit down and think about my life and think about how that applies. You just put that movie on to go tomorrow. Just like, let me watch this. Yeah, that's a pretty feel-good movie, I guess. Yeah. All right. Um, I think we can put this one to bed. All right, here we go. Since it was your choice, you're up first with a rating. You're the heart. Okay. So this movie, um, it was it was cliched. I think it was cliched. wasn't boring to me. It was it was a, it was cliched, but it was cliched done okay, good enough that I would recommend it to people <laughs> I've already, I've already, I've already, because I, I don't want to go against it because you made some good points, but I've not only would I recommend this, I've already recommended it to for four people. And I sat down and watched it with my mom this afternoon before we watched it again. I do think there's stuff that you can gleam off of this um, 
movie. I think it's just a good movie if you just want to sit down and watch it. It's not a great movie, not a perfect movie. It has a, a fun end. It's just a fun movie to watch. So for that reason, I will give it a 3.5. Yikes. Don't you yikes mine. Staggeringly high. I actually brought it. I actually think I brought it down a little bit. Uh, it was. I think I was going to go with a hard four, but I was like, you know what? I won't go four because even though that would have been an, an eighty percent, eight out of ten, but I decided to. It is. It is above average to me. It's recommendable. Above average. It is above average because there's because I said I like I liked it. It's down. It's right down my alley, but I understand people who would not like this. I think if our compatriot was with us, he would not have liked this movie either. Yeah. For me, I'm going to say, in actuality, this movie was the definition of average. Um, I think in, in the way that you described it as feel good, I think it is probably a dramatic comedy popcorn movie where you know unless you are really going to have to force yourself to uh, think positively about this movie like Kevin did um, I think really you just can just watch it not think much about it the emotional parts are not really super emotional. The conflict is not really consequential conflict. Um, and even the climax is somewhat uplifting. But again, because, because the rest of it was so shoddy, even that is stunted um, dramatically. So... While the movie had good performances, while I think even that the music is noteworthy and is perhaps the best thing that this movie has going for it outside of a runtime under two hours, um, which if you have to watch this, at least that makes it palatable. Um, my recommendation would not be to watch this. It would be to watch, uh, again, on other movies that offer either similar plots or just similar elements. You know, if you want to watch a movie with good music in it, you know, go watch Once or go watch School of Rock, um, you know, or and, and so on and so on. Although, you know, if you ignore me, there's an 80% chance that you might like this. So whatever. If you like feel-good movies, if you like Lifetime movies, um, if you like cheesy movies, uh, then have at it. But uh, but those of us who don't and who prefer more depth in our cinema, something a little bit more exciting and thought-provoking and not uh, cliched and artificial, uh, then skip it for me one out of five. Oh my which considering the movie is kind of a glowing review compared to some of the other ratings that i've given i thought we were gonna get the big old zeros no and with my choice up next i'm gonna make up for it so so with that, don't forget to join us next week so yeah. we could uh, get more in depth and you can see our next exciting chapter. Yeah. And I also, you know, want to take this moment to announce that uh, just on a personal level, Kev Kevin and I will both be taking a break from social media after we post. <laughs> Uh, a promotional tweet and Instagram post for this episode. So while we still have some episodes left in this season and beyond that, I don't know when I'll return to social media. I'm sure my life is going to be a lot better without it. So I might want to prolong that. Um, so the best way 
Therefore, to you know, follow along is just going to be to subscribe, whether it's on Spotify or Apple or our YouTube channel, so that you know you can get those notifications uh, and keep up with all the latest episodes. Uh, because probably won't be any tweets promoting or any Instagram posts. Um, I'll still I'll still do our web our website um, post on there, but no you, social media. You so, can still comment on our YouTube if you have any suggestions for movies. Yeah, and we're gathering them up because it's season three. We'll be we'll be reviewing some that aren't picked by us. Oh yeah, sure. So yeah, that's that. Anyway, um, this was fun. Uh, thanks for the pick and thanks for the conversation. Um, and yeah, until next time. Later, haters. Love you.